understanding emotions. So, uh, in the first few months, infants match their feeling of tone and face-to-face -face communication. So, it's, so we talk to babies in happy, jiggly voices uh, because we want to elicit happiness out of them, right? Um, why is that? Uh, there's a um, theory of emotional contagion or an argument for it. Emotional contagion is feeling an emotion just because somebody who is proxim pr uh, in your vicinity is also feeling it. And there are instances of it. Like when you look at, you're talking to a friend, that friend is crying, you feel you're tearing up too. Babies cry when they hear, hear other infants crying. I am not looking forward to flying tomorrow. Uh, yes, baby's on board, one baby cries, the other baby starts crying too, emotional contagion. Uh, it happens. Uh, and operant conditioning basically um, can also explain, especially for happy emotions, maybe not for sad, uh, but uh, feeling rewarded, right, when you smile. Um, so feeling good, uh, you know, getting a reward back with uh, this uh, action might also be um, a factor. Three to five months, they match emotion and face to speaker's face. So if the speaker is happy, they smile too. So you start eliciting smiles from the baby and expect others to match their emotions. If they're smiling, they expect that whoever is um, interacting with them also smiles. Social referencing is a very important tool. Uh, it happens ba with babies, but it happens with preschool age children and even with us too. Uh, it's relying on another person's emotional reaction to appraise an uncertain situation. Um, here, uh, the caregiver's role is important and toddler's progress from just reacting. Now, for example, uh, let's say a baby is experiencing strange anxiety. Uh, they, and so, uh, an uncle has come to town, uh, the baby has never seen this uncle, the baby is one year old, um, and the uncle obviously wants to interact with this, uh, let's let it be a niece, uh, but the niece is weary because it has developed stranger anxiety and also has never seen this uncle before, doesn't know what an uncle is, does not, could not care less, it is just a stranger. Uh, now here, what are we going to do? Just because the baby's feeling strange anxiety, we will not uh, have the uncle interact with the baby. Well, that is not a good solution. Um, baby, babies, young children, and as I said, even us, we use social reference. We look to people whom we have a bond with, look at their emotional reaction, and appropriate our reactions accordingly. So children will often look at their parents if they feel like they are uh, at a um, you know uncertain or potentially dangerous situation. In the lab, for example, when we test children too, it is very important that we maintain a good conversation with the mother. We do that not because we want to get to know the mother only, we do want to get to know the mother, but we know that the investment we make in smiling at the mother, talking with the mother, giving things to the mother, taking things from the mother, for example, giving some papers, taking their coat, the child is watching all of that. And all of that is telling the child that we're trustworthy enough such that the mother will engage in these activities with us. So our establishing rapport with the child starts with our first hello we say to the mother, not the first time the child enters the playroom. Uh, and this is especially important if you want to look to see whether a child is also going to trust you. We sometimes say that it's very important that the child accepts something from you. Uh, you offer something, the child takes it, and the child gives something back in return. A few weeks back, I was watching an extremely shy child with Ejam, for example. I don't remember the kid's name or anything. They're all difficult children to you. <laughs> But this child took a long time. We, didn't, we couldn't get the mother out, and the mother was sitting there. And she played for longer than usual because the child needed more warm-up. Uh, but it was very nice to see the child was first unresponsive, so it looked like Ejan was talking to herself, for example. Like she kept cooking. That's the day that you cooked uh, gourmet food. So, and also Ejam's imagination knows no boundaries, so we have a cooking set, so she's telling the child, how about we make um, sautéed mushrooms? 
There was something else, sauteed mushrooms. Cremalu mantar chorvas, yes, cream of mushroom soup. So she's going for these all extravagant dishes there with the plastic set. But she looked like she was talking to herself. The child was mainly watching her. But in time, the child first started, uh, for example, picking up a spoon and stirring something. And then she kept asking from time to time, would you like this? Should we put this ingredient in that ingredient? In? And in time, the child first make, started making suggestions, then started contributing by putting ingredients himself, and then finally accepted uh, Ejam's um, offer uh, of food. And so there, watching it was very clear how the kid was progressing from no trust to building some trust. Uh, and it's very obvious when you know what you uh, want to look at, look for. Now, um, yes. Um, as children age, they also start being able to judge the causes of emotions, but what makes you sad? What makes you angry? Uh, initially, children focus on more external factors and less internal factors, but you have to keep in mind that their understanding of the mind uh, is very limited at this age. Something like he's happy because he's swinging high. Uh, or what could be an internal explanation for this? He's happy because he wanted to swing high and he's managing to do that, right? So there's a motivation component to it, which is more complex for children. Understanding of the mind develops uh, at this stage and gradually. Um, yes, uh, at this time they may offer improper consolation to others who are feeling sad. So, for example, if the mother is sad and crying, the child might bring their teddy bear and give it to the mother, thinking it's going to ease uh, their pain. Uh, these are very sweet, innocent, but limited ways of thinking about what makes somebody unhappy or happy. Uh, I always see this with gift buying sometimes uh, with men, and I always wonder if it is correct that they actually got stuck in this stage because some, some people buy gifts that they like. I don't know if you have friends like that. Uh, and good gift givers always think about what you would like, right? So I once uh, got a, a sculpture of three ants climbing on top of one another, uh, which was a candle holder from my brother, uh, which I thought like, uh, he likes insects and ants, but I'm very scared of uh, insects. So I thought like, what is this? Like what kind of a gift? Is it? But he's gotten so much better over the years. He was young then. Uh, so starting with four years of age, they recognize that thinking and feeling are connected. Uh, and they start balancing external and internal factors, such as he's happy. That I just said it. More effective ways of helping others uh, under stress develop too. In middle childhood, they start being able to consider conflicting cues. Um, and so if there's a child smiling but standing next to a broken bike, they may be able to understand why that child is smiling, although they are standing next to a broken bike. So a scenario uh, could be um, that, you know, they just, this kid just wanted a bike, he can fix the bike, uh, and he got a broken bike, for example, uh, for free. So he's happy, he's going to fix it, he's going to have a bike. Like this scenario makes us understand why someone would be smiling next to a broken bike. And in middle childhood, they start being able to appreciate uh, these. But they also start understanding mixed emotions. Happiness with a tint of sadness, right? For example, <clears throat> and also appreciate self-conscious emotions. Happiness versus pride. Pride is happiness too, but pride also has a component of a societal perspective. I need to be proud of my, everybody would, are, is proud of me. And not only happy for me, but proud of me because I have accomplished something beyond the expected. Social experience and emotional understanding. Your caregivers, again, are important. They teach about emotions and they scaffold emotional thought. Uh, they explain the causes of emotions. Um, for example, siblings and friends are also important in a different way. See, caregivers have, um, they, they have this asymmetrical relationship. We're going to talk more about it in 350, but they have this asymmetrical relationship because the adult always knows. So adult is always in this position of the knowledgeable person 
who's able and can change things. But with siblings and friends, this is different. Also, for example, if the child is playing a competitive game, let's say, th say a six or seven year old is playing a competitive game, losing may elicit tears, right? Now, if enough tears flow, a father who's playing with the child, a mother who's playing with the child may lose the game just to make the child happy. Friends and siblings don't do that. Right? So friends and siblings have symmetrical relations, and children need both. These symmetrical relations will basically teach these children how to negotiate. Uh, when two, two parties, for example, disagree in, in a play, they won't, uh, uh, one child will not just try to please the other child, usually. They will fight for what they want, but they will learn how to negotiate, how to compromise uh, because of this. Um, yes. And so um, sympathy and empathy develops. These two terms are very widely misused, by the way, in layman's terms, especially in Turkish. We kind of feel like sympathy is a liking of someone. Uh, if you feel sympathetic towards someone, you like that person in Turkish. Uh, but this is actually sympathy in the psychology literature is feeling concern or sorrow for another's plight. And so it is feeling sad for somebody. But empathy, and it's different than empathy. We sometimes use empathy in this way. Empathy is feeling same or similar emotions as the other person. So empathy could be positive too. Empathy doesn't have to be negative. So you could be happy with your friend and for your friend. Empathy requires uh, perspective taking. That's why here it's a complex mix of cognition and affect. It is not just about feeling an emotion for a person, but cognitively appraising the situation, maybe putting yourself in their shoes to feel that emotion. Uh, and uh, these two things are different, so I would very much like you to learn these definitions, which are the definitions for psychology rather than layman's terms. Development of empathy, newborn sense other babies distress, uh, but also requires self-awareness to be able to take another person's perspective. So they need to first develop the self, which will be the topic of the next chapter. It increases over school years. In adolescents, they can empathize with general life conditions of people they have never met. Because you know, I know, that they are more capable of more abstract thought. They don't need to know a person to empathize with that person. Um, their individual difference is empathy. And here we come to temperament. Um, so temperament is basically uh, very basic personality features, but these are very basic. So it is not like when you describe your personality, you might say, you know, I'm a courageous person, I am a patient person, I am uh, a righteous person, I am a this person, that person. Temperament is the bare bones of it. It's not going to be as detailed. Uh, and here uh, it is, I'm going to talk now for about 10 minutes about temperament. So um, it is moderately heritable, so parents' temperament. Children, their temperaments resemble their parents' te uh, temperament uh, moderately. Um, and if a child by temperament is social, assertive, and good at emotional regulation, it leads to higher empathy. Um, and um, here, uh, aggressive children may show less empathy in middle childhood, uh, and that's, I guess, self-explanatory. Warm, sensitive, empathic parents lead to high empathy, and they help children learn to neg regulate negative emotions. We will later also see that these parents also use more effective discipline strategies. For example, when a child does something wrong, they focus on the consequences of that behavior on another person. If a child knocks another kid's tower, for example, the mother instead of just saying, you know, ayyip or something, uh, basically tells the child um, that, you know, you have made your friend sad. You know, your action has caused this kid sadness, and that's why he's crying. What can we do to make this situation better? Uh, so parents uh, who employ these strategies also seem to have kids who are higher in empathy. Temperament is the early appearing stable individual differences. Again, bare bones, so it's in reactivity and self-regulation.
right? So we're not looking at personality characters like likes art, for example, is creative. These are not the topics of temperament. We are looking for bare bones, self-regulation, and reactivity. Reactivity is the quickness and intensity of emotional arousal, attention and motor. How fast does the baby or the child react to stimuli and self-regulation strategize strategies that modify reactivity. About 40% of children are at birth as, or right after birth uh, classified as easy children. Uh, so they're easy to deal with. They have regular rhythms, for example. They're regular sleepers, regular eaters. They're every parent's dream in this sense. Right? Uh, that about 10% uh, are classified as difficult children. So they're highly reactive. They can't be soothed easily. Um, uh, slow to warm up is 15%. These kids are basically a little bit more fearful. They need a lot of encouragement, a lot of cuddling. Uh, and they eventually do things. For example, if it's a new toy, they may want to touch it, but they may refrain from touching it. But parents who are you know, persistent, calm, and warm uh, in their support for their children's um, quest to try new things also, uh, can get over this. 35% uh, is unclassified though. So don't think that we can take any child and put them in one category. There are two categorization uh, rubrics. One is by Thomas and Chess. The other one, a shorter one, is by Rothbarth. And these actually mirror one another. As you can see, activity level are in both. Rhythmicity is basically how regular is the child, say, sleeping, eating. That's just the rhythmicity. A distractibility here, we have attention span. Uh, how distractible is the child? How persistent is the child? Will the child c quickly cry or give up if they try to do something and can't? Uh, approach withdrawal, and you can see fearful distress here, are very much um, similar. Um, and so how quick is this child to approach new people, new stimuli, versus how much do they withdraw, how uh, tentative are they? Um, then we have... Oh, attention span versus also here. Uh, intensity of reaction. So how intense is their reaction? Uh, threshold of responsiveness uh, and quality of mood. Is this a happy baby generally? Is this a fussy baby generally? Here Rothbart in his shorter one uh, looks at positive affect. Uh, effortful control here is the ability to regulate themselves um, and so on and so forth. So, but, yes. The difference, the difference is just these are categorizations, so they have different coding schemes. So infant comes, you observe the infant, and then you basically classify, rate them accordingly. It is just that these two are different ways of assessing the same thing that are developed by, by different researchers. What I'm trying to show is they still center on the two things, uh, the regulation and reactivity components. So, shy and social temperament. But I would never ask you to memorize all of these and ask which one is Rothbart's or I could select a few and ask what would this mean, uh, which of the two dimensions of temperament does this rely most on, something like that, but even that isn't a good question for me. Um, so uh, shy uh, and social temperaments, uh, they're inhibited shy children. These are react negatively and withdraw from new stimuli. Uh, they show it's not only a matter of preference physiologically too. They show higher heart rates, higher stress hormones, and more stress symptoms when they're confronted with new situations, new people, new objects. Uh, and we see higher right hemisphere frontal cortex activity with these uh, babies. There are also uninhibited and sociable children which react positively and approach new stimuli without hesitation. Uh, they have lower heart rates uh, when they're confronted with new people, objects, or places. Uh, they have lower stress hormones and stress symptoms. Uh, they show higher left hemisphere frontal cortex activity when in confronted with these new stimuli. Now, it looks like you know, if I could say which one of these would you choose if you could, in, in the future, if you could have a baby, which one of these uh, would be an easier baby to deal with, 
I think that you would go with this one. However, this one has its advantages too. Um, yes. Fearful children here, two years later, at two years, are better at effortful control when they are four years of age. So those children who were inhibited and shy when they were two years of age actually show better effortful control because they keep controlling themselves even if you try, like, you're not encouraging control. Uh, these uninhibited kids uh, can also be irritable and angry at two years. They're not all of them. But it can be. The uninhibitedness uh, may also result in uh, more spontaneous behavior without thinking consequences, and they might be less effective at effortful control. Uh, so sometimes we get parents who are very worried that their infants are shy, for example. It doesn't seem like, at least academically speaking, shyness uh, is not uh, something that inhibits academic performance and cognitive achievement. But parents do have to make the conscious effort to try to get these kids to try new things, right? Uh, and to, but how do you do that? Uh, basically, uh, with warm coaching, with telling these children what is to come, so not surprising them with big events. So if you have, for example, an inhibited shy child, you know you have an inhibited shy child. The child is four, and you want to take the child to the circus for the very first time. It is a good idea to start talking about the circus before you get there. I mean, not maybe in the car, even before. You tell the child that it is going to be a big place. It might be a tent, maybe, a big tent. That there are going to be a lot of people. That you're going to hold the child's hand. That you have a ticket, you know where to sit, because there is no worry about where to sit. You know, there, there won't be a seat left for us. No, we have a ticket. The animals are going to be further away from us, and they're going to be very different animals. And then one can go into which animal are you most interested in seeing. So what are you doing? You're consciously preparing this child and potentially lowering their anxiety to a really new and potentially anxiety-provoking situation so that they can enjoy it more. So parents who give this kind of coaching have children who, who might be shy and inhibited but are willing to try new things. Right? So this is not um, the child's fate that they won't try new things. But how stable is t temperament? Stability is low in infancy and toddlerhood. So it doesn't mean that just because you have a fussy, difficult baby, you will have a very difficult toddler or a difficult preschooler. Uh, but it's moderate in preschools. By the time the child gets to preschool, that temperament becomes more stable. Um, some children remain the same, but many of them also do show change. Um, and there are many influences on temperament. Um, there could be genetic influences, but don't forget that it takes two people to take, make a baby, at least in 2017, that's what it takes, two people. Maybe in the future it is only going to take one person uh, who knows, three people. I have no idea where science is going. But it takes two people to make a baby. So you have your temperament and you have your partner's temperament, right? Your wife, your husband, your partner, whoever that is. So in any case, these temperaments may not be identical or even very similar. So um, it would be wrong to assume that your child will, in temperament, completely resemble you. Um, and I guess that underlies the saying of uh, these are all your father's traits and babana benziyorsun, yes. So uh, the genetic influence is vary with temperamental trait, but also age. We may see less influence as children get older. Environmental in influences are also important. Some cultures, for example, promote shyness and inhibited behavior. Certain Asian cultures prize this kind of behavior. So even children who are not very shy or inhibited may actually display this. Although globalization and changing world, we see changes in Asian societies too. I'm going to talk about it in a second. The goodness of fit uh, is fitting basically the genetics with the environment. So it might be that a fearful inhibited child might thrive with very good parenting who supports it. Also, an uninhibited child might also thrive if there's a mother or father who sets rules, who has 
firm but warm discipline. Uh, so the goodness of fit is basically getting these environmental factors and fitting them with the child's personality. This also uh, is what is complex when you have more than one children, one child. So one child might be inhibited, the other one might be very outgoing and needs to be regulated more. So the parenting that each child requires, what is good parenting for these two children, may be different, may not be identical. I mean, of course, love and affection underlie everything. That's not going to change. But the discipline, the coaching, the support will be different uh, according to infant's, uh, temper uh, ad, uh, infant's temperaments. And here, uh, temperament correlations for identical and fraternal twins. As you know, we like looking at twins because twins give us a lot of cues about or clues about heritability of certain facts, especially identical twins. And so we have the red bars are identical twins. The yellow bars here are fraternal twins. But what are these showing? So these are basically correlation between ratings of emotional reactivity. Uh, and here, uh, what the ones that are above this bar are rated as similar in temperament. So higher the bar, the more similar they are. But here, if it goes below this threshold, then they are rated as being dissimilar. Yes. And so here, what you have is the researchers' ratings, right, for identical and fraternal. So uh, in this study, researchers observed children and they rated temperament, but also they asked parents. But what is going on here? Uh, let's just brainstorm about this for a second. So the, it seems like the researchers are seeing these twins, either um, identical or fraternal, as more similar to one another than the parents. Especially with fraternal twins, parents are actually seeing them quite dissimilar. Why might this be? Who is more objective here? Yes, Elif. Parents are, <coughs> parents are objective. Okay, take away lesson in developmental psychology. Parents seem to be the least objective of all resources concerning children. There are lots of research that not only do researcher versus parent, but they also do teacher versus parent, researcher, teacher versus parent, and researchers and teachers are more like one another than the parents. Parents have a stake in this. Ask any parent, all loving parents will claim their kid is extremely smart. <laughs> no? Yes? I mean, no, I mean, not that the kids are not smart. Uh, I'm not saying that. But for each parent, they want to see the most positive, right? Uh, and so here something is happening. Let's assume the parents aren't the most objective. Why, why might this be then? Why are they being non-objective in these ways? The goodness of fit model, I already described it. Um, it is basically the parent's ability also to provide discipline, love, and care uh, according to the child's uh, personality, features, temperament. Uh, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that, for example, difficult children may more often tr trigger insensitive responding, right? Because they're difficult to start with. Uh, but if parents are sensitive to difficultness, uh, sensitive, difficultness decreased significantly by age two or three. So uh, their uh, parents with difficult children could be given coaching. And don't forget, there's a heritability factor. The difficult kid might have a difficult parent too, right? Uh, and so it is important that the parent also gets some support. Uh, this is shyness and adjustment among Chinese fourth graders. And here what you see is 1990, 1998. This is teacher rated competence of children and peer acceptance, the yellow bar. Uh, and what is happening is that teacher rated competence is going down, peer acceptance gradually, but here is there's a break off goes down. By 2002, China is opened to the world. Uh, globalization is in effect. They're more closed here in the 1990s. And the Eastern traditional way of looking at um, you know, the person within a society or a community might ask for less assertiveness and more compliance. Uh, but as, uh, and so shy kids are basically showing that. Uh, but here uh, at year 2002, 
how shyness and inhibition in general is viewed both by peers and also by teachers have changed. So this is a very good example of how the cultural context may support certain temperamental traits versus uh, others and how this can change. So it is very wrong, you know, I um, have take issue with research that does these broad stroke classification, Eastern cultures, Western cultures, there's so much variability within cultures and these cultures are so dynamic too that they keep changing. So I, for example, here being in Turkey, doing research with people from Ankara, I expect variances. I expect variances according to education levels, for example. I can't say all Turkish mothers do this. And if I said it, you would take issue with me too. Not on the case of just individual variability, but there could be systematic variability due to other moderators, right? The infant caregiver relationship. Attachment, yes. Now, attachment is a strong affectionate tie that humans feel towards special people in their lives. And it is not something in a person. It refers to a relationship. It is between two people. Um, it is not something that exists in the child, attachment, not something that exists in the parent. It is the result of the interaction of these two. Uh, and it is... Uh, very much um, affected by our thinking in evolutionary uh, ways. Uh, and uh, here it is important that uh, infants and mothers feel a bond that, that make them stay close to one another, right? Uh, and this is important for the child's, was back in the day, still is, child's survival and child's protection uh, because human infants are born very helpless right, as compared to many species actually, uh, our term of infancy and childhood lasts longer than cats, for example. They're self-sufficient at much faster rates. So the infant needs to be cared for for longer periods of time. In order for this to happen, the infant and the caregiver needs to bond. Now, this also uh, provides a very important, again, survival value um, ability. And that is of exploration. Children learn through exploration, right? So just staying close to mother will not suffice. A healthy, growing child cannot just be stuck to her mom's leg uh, 18 hours a day. They need to be able to feel secure enough that they explore, they play, they look around, they do all the things you don't want your kid to do when they just start walking, right? And so this, the ability for the child to explore within a parameter while the adult is there, this is secure based behavior. It's a hallmark of attachment in which the infant uses the caregiver as a base for exploration. Meaning if the child knows that they are in danger, they know who to run to and the person is close by. But they have to form that relation. So the logic behind attachment is that the child needs to figure out a way to stay close to the caregiver. Let's assume this is the mother. And it, there's separate attachments to mother and to father, right? So let's assume this is the mother, though. What needs to happen is that the child needs to figure out what is the best way that I can stay close to this woman. Right? And we will see that there are several adaptive uh, attachment types. So theories of attachment, they all start with Freud's dry reduction explanation. We'll not uh, go into this a lot. But this was mostly based on nutritional needs. The mother fed the baby. There was the oral fixation. Uh, in return, the child becomes attached. Many of you know that Harlow and his monkeys came along. And Harlow showed that food by itself is not enough for that bond to happen. Children do get nutrition out of um, agents who feed them, but uh, in moments of terror, in moments of fear, they run to those that provide some com comfort. For the poor Harlow monkey here, it was this robotic thing with the towel on top of it. Uh, luckily, uh, 
we don't do such experiments with children. Uh, and I don't think we can do it with monkeys uh, in this day and age either. Uh, but what was the significance of Harlow's study? If you are interested, haven't watched, if you are, this is the first psych uh, class you're taking or something, uh, please do watch this video to get a better understanding. But many people here have watched this video more than once. So uh, for Freud, uh, attachment um, is to the figure that provides the food. Um, but um, for others, um, um, also, for Harlow, for example, it is not just food, but also comfort. Behaviors also come along, uh, and they say, um, uh, well, why is it that children also attach to abusive parents? So that it's hard to explain, so there's a question here. Because they do get attached to abusive parents, uh, but those abusive parents aren't providing comfort, right? Uh, because they're abusive. So let's think about this a little bit more. And Bowlby comes along with this ethological explanation uh, with a heavy evolutionary uh, influence of all evolutionary thinking. This is my absolute favorite. Uh, I'm completely for this one. Uh, I won't fight you on this. Uh, and so here is Bowlby uh, and says, well, he studies children uh, who were separated from their parents in World War II, and he sees that fear gets replaced by depression and despair, and later a, a form of a state of detachedness, um, of indifference. So these children who were separated from their parents in World War II displayed these. Uh, and uh, Bowlby says that detachment provides a balance between an infant's need for safety and their need for varied learning experiences. Harlow's experiments with monkeys provide very nice support for this, um, but also um, when we look at real life babies, not monkeys now, we see that a baby needs a parent who's willing to provide care, a social partner, here a social partner who is willing to engage in primary intersubjectivity with the child. Uh, we know that the baby is ready for this because they prefer uh, looking at faces, they start uh, engaging in social smile, uh, and they like synchrony, right? So they have all of the prerequisites uh, for um, engaging with the social partner, uh, and they need a parent uh, who will keep them safe as they explore the world. But they're given one type of parent, and the, the infant's job, uh, the young child's job, is to figure out how to stay close to this person. Then, um, I just want you to think, don't say anything, just all thinking happens here. Um, think of the people you have dated, or think of the people who are your best friends. They must have different ways that they prefer interaction with. Some people like to be called every single day, several times a day. They like to stay in close proximity. Others might sometimes withdraw, and you know that those people would like you to interact with them at whenever you know, they wish to. So it, there might be longer intervals. Maybe with this best friend, you don't talk every day, but you kind of text, or you text every other day. Right? And so we all have our preferences. Some people like, you know, to be very close, others a little bit more distant. And you might imagine that there are different types of mothers too. And the infant's job is to figure out what is the best strategy to remain close to this mother. Okay? So not all, all mothers are the same, their preferences are different. Infant's job, the problem they need to solve, is how to remain close to this person. Okay, now this will come handy. So there are phases of attachment. Pre attachment is from birth to six weeks. They have subtle preferences for mother, but they're not fussy when handed to others. Second stage is attachment in the making. This is six weeks to six to eight months. They show clear preference for the caregiver. Stranger weariness, stranger anxiety, in other words, they are the same thing. Starts. Um, the clear-cut attachment is happening between 8 months and 18 to 24 months where the caregiver becomes the secure base. 
uh, this is especially in unusual or ambiguous situations. You see the child, for example, look at the caregiver more when they feel like they might be in danger, they're uncertain. Uh, when the caregiver smiles, baby relax. Caregiver, when the babe, caregiver looks worried, babies, especially girls, will move away. And separation anxiety starts. So th there's distress when the caregiver leaves. And this lessens after the second birthday. And that's exactly when we start looking at attachment. The reciprocal relationship, this lasts for several years. Caregiver and child take responsibility in maintaining contact. Child actively appropriates behavior to maintain relationship. At this stage, the attachment is established. So now the baby's figured out one strategy to keep close to the mother. This is bidirectional. The mother also promotes this behavior, so they basically uh, keep on this relation. It is believed that attachment is based on what is called internal working models. Internal working models are sets of beliefs about who we are, about how worthy of love we are. Uh, this is general expectations. It's the expectation that if you were in trouble, would people offer help to you? Right? And so we develop this. Um, and do you see the people who will help you as people who are available and responsive, or people who will be hard to access, and it will be very difficult to elicit helping from them? And this mental model, call it a mental schema, is carried forward. And so the attachment relation that the baby forms with the caregivers in his or her life is going to affect the attachment relationships that the person uh, establishes later down the road. Now, um, if so I'm going to, at the end, tell you that attachment can change, but attachment is very difficult to change. But I want to leave you with one thought. Attachment is not love. It is not the same thing. Love are all those positive emotions that you feel. Attachment is a strategy initiated by a problem of how to stay close to a person. And I think thinking of attachment as love is problematic because attachment figures are not too numerous. Be children don't get attached to 40 people when they go to preschool. At any given point, we have uh, probably attachment figures that won't exceed the fingers of one hand, right? A child does not get attached to their grandmother if that grandmother is random seen and lives in a different city. Love is something else. They may love their grandmother, but attachment is something different. So you don't get attached to every boy you date for a week. It would be horrible if you did that. <laughs> attachment takes a long time to get established, and then it's very much influenced by your previous attachment relationships, too. So let me leave you with this. When I come back, we will keep talking about attachments and different patterns of attachment and finish this chapter. Thank you.